I'm Dr. Stephen Liu. I'm a medical oncologist at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. I specialize in lung cancer and cancers of the head and neck. I see patients at all stages of disease from early stage who are undergoing surgery or radiation to later stages who will be receiving chemotherapy. When I made the decision to join the faculty at Georgetown, being able to operate clinical trials was an important part of that decision. The standard therapies for both cancers of the lung and head and neck are not good enough. And the ability to offer a chance at something better was important to me. Lombardi is a very experienced multidisciplinary team. We work very closely with our surgeons, radiation oncologists, our pathologists and radiologists, pulmonologists. Clinical trials really should be considered for anyone with cancer or even for some patients at risk of cancer. There are many different types of trials. Some trials are not interventional. Some trials simply seek to further the science and may involve nothing more than a blood draw and some questionnaires. Other trials involve new treatments and those can be for patients with early stage cancer or for late stage cancer. Well, I think once you have a diagnosis of cancer, you should explore possible appropriate clinical trials at every step along the way. We should not think of it as a last resort. We should not think of it after all possible therapies have been exhausted because many of our trials may offer the chance at better outcomes than some of the established treatments. A lot of our trials are alternatives to chemotherapy, featuring either targeted agents, which could be oral or pill form, or immunotherapy drugs. Some are in combination with chemotherapy, and some completely replace chemotherapy. These new drugs are changing how we think of cancer. We're really trying to change lung cancer into more of a chronic disease, something that we may not be able to cure, but something we can control and treat for hopefully a very long time. When you're diagnosed with cancer, it's a devastating diagnosis. It changes your life and the life of everyone around you. And the opportunity to be a part of that, the opportunity to help a patient through that journey is nothing short of a privilege. I won't be able to cure everyone, but I do believe I'll be able to help everyone. So it's important to distinguish between a primary and a secondary lung cancer. A secondary lung cancer really is a different type of cancer. For example, when a colon cancer spreads to the lungs, it still behaves like a colon cancer and should be treated like a colon cancer. When we talk about lung cancer, we're generally referring to a primary lung cancer or cancer that has started in the lungs. Within lung cancer, there are two main types, small cell lung cancer and non-small cell. Small cell lung cancer is less common, accounting for about 13% in this country. It is more aggressive and requires treatment with chemotherapy, sometimes radiation. Non-small cell lung cancer makes up the majority of cases, about 85% in the U.S. And within non-small cell lung cancer, there are many important subtypes and many different treatment options. When lung cancer is confined to the lungs, it may cause no symptoms at all. As it grows and comes into contact with airways and nerves, it may cause symptoms like cough, shortness of breath, or hoarseness. As the cancer spreads to other organs, it can lead to pain, headaches, laboratory abnormalities. And in general, cancer can cause symptoms like fatigue, weakness, and weight loss. The difficulty with lung cancer is that because the lungs are so dynamic, because the lungs can compensate so well, smaller tumors will go undetected. Even the early symptoms of cough and shortness of breath may not be unusual for someone who is a smoker, for example. Uh, and the lack of unique symptoms is why lung cancer is often spread uh, by the time it was diagnosed. Lung cancer must be diagnosed by examination of the tissue, usually through a biopsy. Now, we do not yet have a blood test that can diagnose lung cancer. And while CT scans and PET scans can identify suspicious areas, they cannot establish the diagnosis. For that, you need either a biopsy or surgery. Surgery and radiation are excellent options for the right patient. When lung cancers are detected very early, surgery is an effective and curable strategy. Our surgeons here at Georgetown are using the most advanced techniques typically minimally invasive, that has led to shorter hospital stays, faster recovery, and better outcomes. When surgery is not an option for medical reasons, we have a radiation team that's very experienced at CyberKnife stereotactic radio surgery, which can also be a great alternative to surgery. When the cancer is slightly more advanced, involving certain lymph nodes, surgery may not be an immediate option. 
For those patients, a better option may be a combination of chemotherapy and radiation, and possibly a clinical trial. With all these modalities, surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, our outcomes are better if we can detect that cancer early. Early detection is very important for lung cancer. When we can detect cancer at an early stage, it gives us a better chance at curing that cancer. But the most curable cancers are the least likely to develop any symptoms. So how can we detect an asymptomatic lung cancer? We do not have a blood test that can be used for lung cancer screening, but recent studies have shown that low-dose CT scans can improve the chance at detecting an early stage lung cancer. For a high-risk population, which would be over the age of 50, a smoker of at least a pack a day for 30 years, and smoked within the past 15 years, the use of a low-dose CT scan decreases the risk of dying from lung cancer by 20%. We have an established lung cancer screening here at Georgetown uh, with very experienced pulmonologists and radiologists, and that's led to the detection of very early stage lung cancers that wouldn't normally have been found. Mutations are changes in the DNA of a cell that can alter the behavior of that cell. Cancer develops when those changes enhance the cell's ability to grow, to divide, to proliferate, and to spread. Mutations can occur by chance, they can be inherited, or they can be the result of exposure to toxins such as cigarette smoke. For lung cancer, we know that cancers with specific mutations behave differently and should be treated differently. Our ability to detect new mutations is changing every day, and matching these mutations with specific targeted agents is the key to personalized medicine. For example, if a lung cancer harbors a mutation in a gene called epidermal growth factor receptor, the best treatment for that patient may be an oral pill, a once-a-day medication that has fewer side effects than chemotherapy, but also works better than chemotherapy, works for longer than chemotherapy. And when that pill stops, another pill may be a different option. In the past, chemotherapy had very severe side effects and negatively impacted a patient's quality of life, but those times have changed. Our ability to deliver chemotherapy has improved. We're better at giving the drugs, better at preventing and treating a lot of the side effects. But with any treatment, a strong relationship between the patient and physician is important. A direct line of communication that allows the doctor to alter or adjust chemotherapy based on the symptoms that patient is having is essential to maximizing the quality of life. Our immune system can be a powerful weapon. It has the ability to target and destroy cancer cells, but we've been unable to harness that power. Our traditional treatments have at best ignored, and in many cases worked against our immune system. Immunotherapy is the use of newer medications that partner with the immune system. These techniques have been very effective in treating things like melanoma, kidney cancer, and prostate cancer, but in recent years, that treatment has been very effective for lung cancer. Newer antibodies targeting molecules like PD-1, PD-L1, and several newer proteins have allowed us to harness the ability of our immune system to control lung cancer cells. Immunotherapy offers an alternative to chemotherapy, and while this treatment does not work for everyone, it has the ability to work very well. And there are many patients that have been on treatment for years, a sustained immune response against their lung cancer that we wouldn't expect with traditional chemotherapy. Patients with lung cancer often have other medical conditions that make delivery of traditional chemotherapy challenging and difficult. And that's why clinical trials looking at chemotherapy alternatives are very attractive for these patients. Lung cancer is a disease of older patients, usually smokers with other medical conditions, and the use of non-chemotherapy drugs, such as immunotherapy, such as targeted agents, offers a better tolerated and in many cases better effective option. One of the challenges in treating lung cancer has to do with its location. When a cancer is in the lungs, it may not cause any symptoms until a very late stage. Treating cancer at a later stage, any cancer, would lead to worse outcomes. Early detection is more challenging in lung cancer, primarily because of the lack of symptoms. But its location is also essential to very important processes, such as breathing. When you have a cancer that's affecting breathing, there's a sense of urgency. And keeping things as they are may not be good enough.
Cancers of the head and neck are challenging to treat primarily because of their location. When you have a cancer of the throat or the mouth, it affects many of the processes that define who we are. Our speech and our voice, our ability to eat and swallow, our ability to breathe. Establishing a proper treatment plan requires addressing all of these symptoms and all these systems in addition to delivery of chemotherapy. It's been very clear that our outcomes with lung cancer are better if we can detect it earlier. Screening allows us to detect cancers at an early stage before they develop any symptoms, before they develop problems, when our chance at curing that lung cancer is the greatest. If we wait until that cancer develops symptoms, our ability to treat and cure that cancer is much worse. The most common types of head and neck cancer are squamous cell carcinoma, which describes the cell in which that cancer started. There are other rarer types, such as salivary gland cancers and lymphomas. Those would be treated very differently, but almost all cases of head and neck cancer are squamous cell. There are two main risk factors for head and neck cancers. The biggest risk factor is smoking and alcohol. For certain types of head and neck cancer, those at the base of tongue, those in the tonsil. Another important risk factor is human papillomavirus. Human papillomavirus, or HPV, has been linked to other cancers, such as cervical cancer. This is a virus that many of us are exposed to, but only some of us retain, and in a fraction of those patients, it can lead to the development of this cancer. Human papillomavirus-related head and neck cancers have a much better outcome if treated properly, and really reflect a different type of disease process. Patients would be considered high risk if they have a strong smoking history. We would define that as one pack per day for 30 years, or the equivalent, two packs per day for 15 years, half a pack a day for 60 years. If they'd smoked within the past 15 years, so people that had quit 20 or 30 years ago would be at lower risk, though still higher risk than someone who'd never smoked at all. And certainly the age is also a risk factor. The high risk group would be between the ages of 50 and 74.